Well, that was fun. We're coming to you from the last day of London Fashion Week. As always, it was a swirl of shows, presentations, parties, and protests, not to mention a record-setting number of delivery room meals. I'm Emily Cronin, Senior Fashion Editor at The Telegraph, and your host for the London Fashion Week special of Fashion Unzipped. With me in the studio are Charlie Gowans Eglinton, another senior fashion editor. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Emily. <laughs> and Lisa Armstrong, our head of fashion. Hello. Hi. So glad to have you here. So, Charlie, I have to ask just just to start, what was your highest step count day from Fashion Week? Oh, uh, well, you and I had very close competition, didn't we? We I did. Think I did fifteen thousand something. Oh no, it was twenty five thousand something on you, Saturday. You did twenty five thousand something, and so did I. But how, did you beat that yesterday? I don't think I did. I okay. think you might have taken the crown. So for all these, you know, pics of fancy cars that we ride around in, uh, people, we still walk everywhere. We've got the and shoes to prove it. You've got the <laughs> shoes to prove it. Right now, in fact, you guys are wearing some of the most seen shoes on the front row at Fashion Week. Lisa, can you tell us about the shoes? Well, they are flat form, a tweed flat form. They are from Kurt Geiger and they are... Uh, let's say a tribute to Chanel, but I think the Chanel ones were about £990 and these aren't. And that's why you saw a lot and they're so comfortable. Um, I don't I don't ever want to take them off. A street star photographer actually stopped you, Lisa. Oh, yes, they did. That's right. <laughs> and they said to me, are they Gucci? And, you know, fair dues for trying. And and I think Beth Ann or Sophie Warburton, and other members of our team... T- Gucci. They're meant to be Chanel. And the dual <laughs> man sort of withered. Oh, no. They do have a, a Gucci style sort of button almost. A little eagle crest that's very. Yes. I mean, I just think that I the think point he, is we saw a lot of comfortable shoes on the catwalks, didn't we? We did. On the catwalks and on the front row, it was like the season mm. of Tevas on Editor. Yes, exactly. But, but sort of very, very expensive designer version Tevas, which pretty much looked the same as the. <laughs> Not designer. I, I didn't know how expensive most of them were, but I was very envious that really hot day when I was in heels yes. and just wished I'd brought Tevas or Birkenstocks. I, I just feel I don't really want to wear uncomfortable shoes anymore. I mean, my feet are, the, are, are like, they're oblong now, my feet. I think what's the joy of these Kurt Geiger sandals is it is cool now to wear something that isn't you know, £2,000, and you get bragging rights when yes. people say, oh, there's a Chanel, and you're like, no, actually, they're fabulous Kurt Geigers. Yes, I'm glad you feel like that. <laughs> I, I find that it also dresses stuff down that could be very over-the-top dressy, like you, what you're wearing, you know, a lace inset cocktail yes. dress. Wear well, it with as black you sandals. Do. As Lisa happens to be in the studio. <laughs> of a Tuesday morning. <laughs> yes, I never know if this is just on planet fashion, though. I wore I wore a sort of practically a lame dress on, on day one of Fashion Week, and on the tube, just people were saying to me, what a beautiful dress. And I could see people smiling. And I thought, are they, do they think I'm insane or are they just enjoying it? And actually, in the end, it doesn't really matter. I if thought you looked fab. Well, yes, yeah, because you work in fashion. Charlie. And it was whistles. <laughs> but whistles. Also, whistles. Relatable. It was relatable. <laughs> and, um, and it was just very, very pretty. And actually, what was so great about that dress is that, you know, people commented on the tube that they liked it. And then I wore it all day long. And then I wore it to a friend's big birthday party in the evening. And people liked it there, too. It was the kind of the dress that you can take anywhere. And I feel that's what fashion is giving us a lot of at the moment. Well, you, you say, you know, is it only on planet fashion? But the odd thing about about the comfortable shoe trend to me is just how from real life it feels. I mean, I never thought that we'd be coming back to work basically dressed as, you know, a 1980s New York career woman on her way to work and mm. staying that way through the whole day, you know, like mm. like with trainers and sandals. Like it's, it's as if we forgot to take off our commuting shoes and yes. put on our real ones. And Except uh, in the it. 80s, we would have been trussed up in some really not very good suit because back then they just hadn't worked out yet how how to dress us for for work for the office so when you look at that you know working girl the the clothes are just horrific oh i think they're great i love the clothes and working girl but you don't want to wear them no absolutely not well, there but you go. the huge shoulders and well anyway we did see a lot of good suiting on the runway didn't we i loved the suiting yes i i really i and i particularly enjoyed <laughs> The uh, sort of again lame. A theme suiting. emerges. Here. I know a theme, a terrible, <laughs> revealing side of my blinginess. I did love the sort of lame suiting at J. W. Anderson. It was gold, wasn't it? With sort of trailing, it was full on gold, yeah. a ribboned kind of. Yes. Lapels. 
Yes. I mean, it was day to night, people. <laughs> or night to night. You know. yeah. Either way. Victoria Beckham seating was great. Loved that. The little the tiny gingham. check. Mm. Yeah, was the it a gingham? Like a micro gingham. Webs, yeah. Su- suiting. But, but I like her suiting because it's very slim. And I feel a lot of trouser suits can swamp you if you're not five foot eight. But because she's little... The cutting just really works on a on a on a smaller on a shorter woman. And Lisa, you talked to Victoria backstage after the show, didn't you? Actually, I yeah, I went to see the collection at her Hammersmith headquarters the day before. She's really professional, actually, and she she always gives you quite a bit of time to look through her boards where they have photographs of all the models in the outfits because it's already been styled. You know what I think is great about her is she will give you a few quips. She knows what's required. She, she plays knows the game. what you need. She plays the game, totally professional. And um, she'll do something seemingly spontaneous. And if you're me, you'll say, oh, my God, sorry, my phone wasn't working. The video's all blurry. I put my hand in front of it. And she'll do it again and again and make it look <laughs> spontaneous every time. But the joy as well with her, because I've been to um, a preview of hers in, in New York when she used to show in New York. And a lot of designers, when they're talking about their collections, will get very kind of involved in a very obscure reference. Yes. And yes, it was very much about this. And it's it's all very intellectual and very highbrow. <laughs> and she'll just say, oh, yeah, well, Harper loved these sparkly shoes. And yes. so then I thought, actually, those are really fun, aren't they? And I really like this colour. And I or thought this was a really I never, shape. I never wear thongs. G strings, and you know that's your headline. I mean, sad to say, that is your headline. But she doesn't talk twaddle, I would say. Even at Roxanda, and she's the queen of the incredible dress, there was so much suiting. We had mm. boiler suits. I mean, these were not like boiler suits that you'd wear to roll under a, a car lift or anything like that, but. And we had a sweatshirt suit and and suits with trailing scarves. It really seemed like a theme of the of the week. My my daughter, who is twenty six, in her first job. No, no, sorry, was well, not in her first job. She's in her second, very senior, fabulous job. Has finally discovered the jacket. She said to me, "You always told me about the power of the jacket, and now I understand it." And she's got this um, sort of uh, WhatsApp going with a with a, a friend who's also discovered jackets and they sort of <laughs> they send pictures of their jacket looks for the day but I've really do love despite my um really sort of scarring experience with suits in the in the early 80s I loved a jacket because you can put it over anything you can put it over some sweats and and look and look sort of pulled together. Roxanne did that too, didn't she? She, she? she didn't have smelly old sweats. They were very superior sweats. <laughs> superior but, sweats. Um, Sounds like a good name for a sporting goods store. Um, well, it kind of took me back to Norma Kamali, who I met for the first time last week, because she she did all that sweat shirting in the 80s. And when I came to London, all the cool girls were wearing Norma Kamali. And it was my first, I think, contact with sort of luxurious utilitarian clothing. You know, I hadn't seen that before. I was just used to utilitarian clothing. And it, I love, I've, I've always loved that mix. I like something that you can wear to anything because you get, your, you get a lot of bang for your buck that way. Great. So comfortable shoes, suiting on the runway. Lots of pretty dresses. Lots of pretty. So we had suiting on the one hand and then pretty mm. dresses on the other. Some of the prettiest dresses were at Erdem. I, I feel like Erdem increasingly specializes in in finding and showcasing obscure women we should all know know more about. And this time his muse was a Mexican a film star turned activist who died in mysterious circumstances in Italy. And yeah, the dresses had just had a great sweep to them, like it really almost meant to be viewed from the side. It was also the setting, though. So we were in beautiful Grey's Inn Gardens um, in central London, which the was Lord, actually... The, yes, where all the... The walks. Barristers... And it was actually reside. designed, I read this this morning, it was actually designed by Sir Francis Bacon at the beginning of the 17th century. And it's just this grand promenade. And the models were kind of, it was it was such a distance for them to walk down. And we were sat all on one side. So we're seeing them with the backdrop of trees and those beautiful buildings. And their scarves were trailing behind them and these silks. And it was so dramatic. 
I loved that show. Didn't you think that they'd really gone out of their way, the designers this time, to find amazing locations? Mm. So there was Gray's Inn, beautiful, and then there was a Victoria Beckham showed in the Foreign Office in Whitehall. I never knew there were that that building was like that, it was sort of soaring marble columns. Mm. It was like the Victoria and Albert Museum in a way, wasn't it? And then... Um, Amelia Wickstead was in the gallery at the Royal Albert Hall, up at the top, which was... So it's the circle and the models were work, walking the whole circle. So you could see them, they were right in front of you, but then you could also see them kind of through the columns right across the balcony, which just amazing. Roxander was um, in the, at the Serpentine Gallery. There were quite a few alfresco shows. Not forgetting Simone Rocha at Alexandra, Alexandra Palace. Roland Murray outside the Royal Academy in a little side side return. Who knew that building had a side return? <laughs> and um, I just think it makes such a huge difference. And it did make me, it made me wonder as I was trying in vain to get an Uber um, from the um, Burberry show at 5.30 yesterday and my deadline was like 20 minutes or, I mean it was just dwindling and dwindling and all the Ubers kept cancelling me the traffic was so bad that Burberry had taken us all to practically the hangar gyratory system <laughs> <laughs> and to put us in a black box right aren't Unusual. there lots of black boxes in central London I mean there's black boxes and there are black boxes. We're in one right now, actually. We, we, we are, it's a bit small. Who are we show. to question the creative, you know, whims yes. of these designers? And I, and I They def- have visions. Yes, I, I do. <laughs> as, as I found last night, <laughs> Emily and I found last night, 50 minutes late, one show. With the strains of memories from cats oh, playing. I, I mean, what, hello. I mean, Richard What's Quinn did like? have... Cats. He had a choir. This is the Richard Quinn show, we should say. He had... We were in the leisure centre, the better leisure centre, mm. in um, just off Old Ford Road in Bethel Green. taking me to Balenciaga <laughs> shows in Paris where they love a leisure You're getting centre. flashbacks. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't think the leisure centre usually has pink carpet. No, I Does think it? they laid down do the think? carpet. Yeah. No, I've been in there before. How, how much do you think a location affects your takeout? from the show oh massively mm. because Simone Rocha Emily was saying it was at Alexandra Palace and Emily and I were sat next to each other and, and you were saying you've been to gigs there before I'd never been in the building I and think it was stunning you know, yes you know we were up on the we were in the nosebleeds but you're looking down from this great height on these models walking kind of slowly in a circle and the music and, and yes it was it was kind of chilling. I, it, it felt like very an amazing. Haunting. Oh, I nearly cried in Roxanda because they were playing some just beautiful music. Mm. It was very. The moving. music is very important. But also, yes. this is something that that Paris has always done exceedingly well: is is kind of take you on a tour of of grand unseen buildings. And now mm. we're getting that in London. It's so inspiring. I mean, there's so many atmospheric venues. Like I think it's, it adds to the experience, doesn't it? When you when you've lived in a city a long time, but you get to see places that you haven't ever seen before. And also, I think with Instagram now, obviously, you can share that aspect much more because so often in the paper or when you see a catwalk supplement, there all the pictures are cutouts of the models on a white background. So you've got no idea where they showed, but. You know, we're all filming those finales and putting them on our stories. So it is, it really is worth the designer's while. Plus, let's not forget, for the first time, some of the shows were, um, they sold tickets to the public, didn't they? Yes, I don't know anything about how effective that was. Yes, apparently, I was was talking to Stephanie Fair, who's the um, chairperson of... um, of of, Lon- of the British Fashion Council, and she said the take up had been incredibly popular. I mean, obviously she would say that, but she j- seemed genuinely not to be lying. Well, it <laughs> probably helped that it was Alexa Chung did two seatings of her show, mm-hmm. and obviously she's a name that transcends fashion as well. She's also a kind of celebrity pop culture name. I think. I mean, the price seems incredibly steep, but I think they were getting some kind of access as well, like going backstage, and and I. I thought it was very encouraging, actually, because, you know, we do get data saying that sort of interest in fashion weeks generally is is sort of starting to decrease and that, the, you know, the algorithms are showing that there's less less social media take up around these these fashion weeks. And which doesn't surprise me because how many catwalk pictures can you look at? Mm. But it's interesting, isn't it, that the the live experience has some real pull on people. I think that the ticket price also got people access to talks. Like there was a talk with Ava Chen and Laura Brown, mm. the editor of InStyle in the U.S. and and 
Ava Chen, who, as we know, is is head of fashion at Instagram. So they definitely got some some unique access, and I would have liked to go to a couple of those things mm. had the schedule permitted. I also wonder if the ticketed events offered a nice, positive consumer-facing story, given the other big happening around the main show venue, which was, of course, Extinction Rebellion protests. Yes, or as our news editor WhatsApped us <laughs> last night, XR, and none of us could think what that meant. <laughs> we we need updates on XR. It was confusing because Xtina was also exactly. at a couple of the shows. <laughs> you know, so. We were more focused on that at that point. But did either of you cross paths with any of the, yes. of the protests? Yes. And when I got to Victoria Beckham outside this amazing Whitehall building near the Churchill War Rooms, they were standing, there weren't that many of them, there were about maybe 15 or 20, and they were all standing in line with placards with various alarming stats about fashion. It was very, very effective, actually. And they stood there, stood there quietly. There was no screaming as we've had before with um, the animal rights protesters. And then one of their, their spokespeople started to speak, again, with more really horrifying stats. And actually... I mean, it slightly was a sat standoff because they were standing one side of the barrier and we were all in a in a queue to get in. But I, I actually think there is no standoff because I think people who work in the fashion industry are equally alarmed by well, the stand and, and want and want somehow to effect change, but maybe at a different rate. The different great pace. thing about a protest like that is it allows conversation, it allows debate because the animal rights protesters are usually being held back. Some of them are, you know, throwing yes. water. Yes. They're, they're shouting, they're chanting shame on you as we walk into the shows. Yes. Um, and, and screaming and, and you know, it's quite scary to walk through. Yes, it's um, intimidating. It's very intimidating and there's security guards holding them back. And it means that as a journalist walking into the shows, most of the time you can't really engage with them because they're screaming in your face and you're a bit, Scared, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a mob coming at you. It was Whereas, very dignified. And who, you know, who's going to argue against what they're saying, really? When I first heard that they were going to be um, sort of doing London Fashion Week, I think I was, I was on holiday. It was in the summer. And I thought, well, at least we're going to have loads to write about. But, oh, my God, the chaos they're going to cause. But and also I thought, well, and they're barking up the wrong tree because actually it's not designers like Erdem who are making, you know, relatively tiny quantities of clothes. And they're all beautifully made by people who are skilled and properly paid. This is not this is not the high street. Um, but then I thought, well, of course, they're going to do it outside those shows, Victoria Beckham, because that they're going that's where they get. They're going to get traction, their yeah, coverage. Yeah, where they can get visibility. Um, so I, you know, why not? Why not? I I think people should be, if they can, if they can protest like that, it was very effective, I thought. I thought it was very cleverly done. I think that people in the industry are, are kind of nodding along because what we would hope is that people buy less and buy better as well. Yeah. And... Part of that is through supporting some of the designers from London Fashion Week. It's not absolutely. It's not the, in the, shunning the this problem, industry. though, with our message, which is you know, buy less, buy better, is that it does come across as quite elitist, and so, you know, we do get. Comp- <laughs> you can't ever win, can you? You know, we get complaints from people who say we are the cause of the Earth's destruction. You, and me, Charlie. Lisa. You and me, Charlie. And <laughs> no, mostly. And now, now that you're back, Emily, <laughs> you. And also, then we get when we when we do um, sort of sustainability features and, and ethical f- clothes, which we're doing all the time now. We get people saying we're elitist, and actually, I think we just have got forget buying better. We've got 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 to buy less. I'm in my fifties. When I was a teenager, I had a wardrobe that was probably I don't know what's that. A meter, not half even, a meter, half a meter, half a meter. and wide, I, 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 and it had everything. I and that was through my twenties as well. We didn't feel we had to buy something every week to, to you know, fulfil our human rights and be content. In fact, Gabriella Hurst said to me, that she opened a store last week in London, and she's a lu- she is luxury, but all her twenty five percent of her will and cashmere now is recycled. She's using. She is not recycling. She's using old wool and turning into a luxury item that people really want. All her hangers are completely biodegradable. 
She's very, very forward thinking. Actually, the hangers, it sounds so boring, doesn't it? But that's a major thing. There's billions of hangers every year that end up in, in waste in, in, in landfill. And that's something that the entire high street can, can do, just cardboard hangers. Because when I was a teenager and I was working in a shop at the weekends and on a Saturday in my lunch break, I would go into a different shop, probably top shop. There weren't very many. I was This was in the high street in Richmond. Um, and I'd go into top shop and I'd buy a new top or dr- skirt or something that I could afford to wear that night when I'd go out and meet my friends. And I did that most weekends. That's how I spent my earnings in the shop. Now, we, I mean, we've just done a feature this fashion week, this London fashion week. We had our picture taken, um, all of the fashion team on Saturday morning and Sunday morning as we were kind of rushing about to and from shows to kind of give a, an insight into what we actually wear, which you can find this feature online or in the paper. And what was interesting when people were sending their credits in, I mean, some of these pieces are six years old and they're mm. old favourites. I personally didn't buy anything new for Fashion Week. Me neither. I got a haircut. That was but my it's one slightly, spend. I mean, we, I think we have to be careful because we, do, we can borrow stuff. But... But, or rent it. Or rent it, which Emily brilliantly did. I but can't I did, wait to read that feature. I didn't do either of those, I'm afraid. All of my mm. stuff was just my own things, just that I love and have been wearing mm. all summer. And I'm so amused when people talk about shopping their own closet. It's like, that's called I, getting dressed. That's I was teasing Lisa about yeah, this last week. I got wrapped over the knuckles for using that ridiculous expression. Well, I said you can't <laughs> shop your own wardrobe. That's just wearing your clothes, which that's what <laughs> wardrobe is. And it just... So happens that as fashion editors, we have quite large wardrobes. And so you might find things that you forget you have. Also, with don't you find in fashion, we start using these stupid terms ironically. <laughs> and then they just you forget the irony. And then you're like, you oh, yes, the I'll shop my you know, wardrobe. The uh, speech marks. <laughs> right. So before Save we get too much, <laughs> before we turn to uh, phrases we hate in <laughs> journalism, let's just let's talk about favorite shows. What were the highlights for you, Charlie? Ooh, well, I loved Erdem, as discussed. That was beautiful. And I loved Simone Rocha because I just thought it was so impactful. Um, Amelia Wickstead, mm. always a, a favourite of mine. The colours, you know, her eye for colour is just fantastic. And she'd riffed on Little Women. I mean, that film is coming um, mm. at the end of this year on Boxing Day. Greta Gerwig's directorial kind of take on Little Women. There weren't very many things that I think Louisa May Alcott would have seen her March Sisters in. But, you know, in a in a 2019 kind of take on the March Sisters, there were beautiful, there was a jumpsuit actually that was really elegant, really tailored. And a lot of her silhouettes are really modern. But then it had an almost kind of Love Island-esque under boob cutout. Yeah, the sub boob cutouts, Risque. very Joe March. <laughs> very, yeah, I, I feel like Amy might have gotten on board with that as well. There was just a lot of swoosh. Um, and I loved... Regina Pio as well. Yes. And this, even this is where us all having excellent taste gets in the way of variety because <laughs> I too loved Erdem and Regina Pio and <laughs> and uh, Molly Goddard. I mean, uh, but with Regina, um, her, again, she's one of these master colorists who mm. whatever colors she puts together suddenly seem uh, it, both inspired and obvious. Like, why didn't I think to do that? Um, what, what some examples? Well, there a few seasons ago, she did a show that was mostly different tones of blue altogether, and it just looks so fresh and gorgeous. And this time, it was lots of khakis and and kind of um, a green that I sort of don't have a a word for. She put lilac with a almost sulfury green. Yes, she had lilac and green. Um, but and that, then confusingly, that day you were wearing like tan trousers and and lilac shoes. I am often ahead of the curve. <laughs> you are. Noticing. What can I say? <laughs> Uh, and and she had these sort of tiny Hawaiian prints that seemed very refined. Um, it, she had hems that were clacking with beads in a way that didn't seem at all purchased from a flea market on holiday. It seemed seemed high fashion. I, I think she's brilliant. And also the prices are really, I'm not going to say accessible because it depends. <laughs> so it depends <laughs> on your budget. But they are, you know. Compared uh, to. Oh, my gosh. They're Odem like or Roxanne 30% of. Dior or Gucci or, or Givenchy. I, I also that. loved um, J.W. Anderson. There, there were a lot of long, more flowy dresses, just like sort of sheaths in neutral colours that it, they weren't like the robe, but it was that sort of vibe, but edgier. and uh, But also some tiny little mini uh, 
sort of fluffy uh, knitted dresses and then these lame trousers suits that weren't really lame. They were much cooler than that. But he too did this weird boob thing. He had these sort of um, rope coils going around the boobs, a bit like um, if you've seen the film Colette where um, uh, Kira Knightley at the end has gone into sort of vaudeville on the stage and then like in the 1920s and she's bare-breasted but with jewels around them. That was very peculiar. I sort of thought maybe he'd been sponsored by Swarovski. I thought if you lifted off those weird boob things, the dresses were just fabulous. I kind of wanted to tie one around my eyes and pretend it was some fabulous aviator's uh, Talking costume. Of ties, our big takeout. Scarves. How could we forget scarves? Well, I loved at Regina P.O. actually over the hair, she'd done sort of little fouillards I, can't, I can never say that word properly. Foulard. She'd done little foulards. No, I'm just going to say she'd done little silk squares, but they were tied so neatly over the hair like Jackie O in Capri. Well, there were scarves everywhere, weren't there? I mean, Erdem tied them over beige trench coats to make them more interesting. People were wearing them in a very sort of Jackie O way on the catwalk. And, uh, and at Burberry, they were like belts. Burberry, uh, Ricardo Tisquiat, she was incorporating them into, you know, there were, there were scarf shirts and um, scarfs, sarongs tied over uh, sort of pencil skirts. I mean, I don't know whether that was just styling or whether they were actual, the skirts were like that. And Ports, Ports 1961, Canadian brand, did a very nice job trying to be minimalist for five or six years, but never really cut through, did it? The, never got much publicity. It's got new design team there, Fabian Baron and Carl Templer. They've both worked at lots of top, top brands. They had the most beautiful scarf prints, didn't they? They spliced lots of prints together. Uh, quite clever clothes. I mean, there was a coat that had three columns of buttons so you could wear it loose or you could use, you know, adjust button up the second row and make it tighter. Um, I thought disaffected Marnie fans going to go crazy for that that collection. And they'd done all this beautiful scarf prints. Beautiful scarf prints. Well, and there, there were more scarves as well. I mean, I know that we already mentioned Erdem, but also cinching these very Beyonce-esque hats um, under the chin and, and dresses made out of them. And there were even, you know, white, beautiful dresses that looked like they were made of sewn together, you know, antique white cotton handkerchiefs. Having said that, have you ever actually worn a silk scarf round your neck? Do you know what? I actually put one on this morning... Nearly did it, but then realised I've just dressed like a 12-year-old boy today because I'm on <laughs> putting the newspaper together duty and I had to be in the office at eight. So I just thought, save that for tomorrow. But I that's wore the... one in my hair during fashion In your week. hair, yeah. yeah. Yes, and I tied went, around a ponytail. In your hair, but in the classic. It actually looked quite... I nearly did. I wish I'd done it today. Wish there there is a street style measure. person who is forever putting her... Like tying a, um, a very Grace kelly scarf around under uh, her no, chin. No, that I would do. With huge sunglasses. Under the chin? Would you like do like under a driving the chin? Well, Obviously scarf. not in public. I'd put it on. <laughs> I'd look in the mirror and think, yes. And then I'd take it I off. I think under the, you know, coming from the front and then going under the hair at the back yes. is very chic. Lisa, yes. do you think maybe a, a scarf like that could be the new turban challenge for you? Well, if you want me to make a fool of myself yet again. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> you, I think you already know the answer to that, Lisa. <laughs> But that's the great thing about the scarf trend is we can already play with it at home. I tell you what, Everyone I, has a scarf. I tell you what I do with the scarf is I wrap it around the handles of my bags. Very bon chic, bon genre, very sort of bourgeois, but hell, I love it. And it's a way of refreshing your bag. Since we are not into buying wastefully, get out your old bag and, you know, fiddle around. It's also a way of tying a bag to a different coloured dress and exactly, shoe. Exactly, that's very because true. Because when I... Actually, when I went to Ascot this year and I was carrying a dark navy bag and a, I was wearing a pale pink dress and it kind of didn't really tie together. So I put a scarf, a printed scarf on the bag. And I think that's a very good point because I think if you are going for an investment bag and you're really, your heart is with the, you know, the pink one, but your your head is telling you tan or, or, or brown. I mean, do, buy the sensible one because you will love it for longer and then... Can right. I sit up or down with scarves? So scarves, flat sandals. What is some other stuff that we saw that we can use in our wardrobes right now? Well, I think we've all got summer dresses, haven't we, that we can um, we can winter up. Um, I, I, I tell you what I'm noticing is that there are skinnier and skinnier, I, I don't mean tighter, but sort of finer gauge 
knit jumpers. They're not even really jumpers. They're like bases. And the dress I'm wearing, for instance, came with two um, very, very stretchy, almost like T-shirts, but not long sleeves because it's, there's a bit of sheer in this dress. So, uh, and, and the jumpers pick out the colours of the dress. So, I, And there are more of those around. And I think that's going to be a, a great thing to, to, to do through the through the autumn I think well boots are everywhere the long boots have really come back big time and I think that's a way of getting more wear out of your long boots and long underwear with summer dresses silky dresses yeah and and layering a chunky (laughs) jumper over I mean we you know it's not that new we've been doing this for a while cardies are back that's a joy yeah what kind of cardies well you've got your Katie Holmes obviously the greyish kind of chunky cardi. A V-neck, wasn't it? A V-neck. Looked quite sexy because she had bare, some bare skin underneath it. And a matching bra. And a matching bra. But Burberry cost 900 did, pounds. <laughs> Burberry did super fine gauge knit cardies, worn kind of open, mm. that were just super fine layers. And it's perfect for this in-between weather when you're kind of hot and cold. That said, I really, one of my favourite things on the that I saw all Fashion Week on the runway was a jumper, which was not super fine gauge, uh, but it was this pink jumper at Molly Goddard that had shoulder slits. So I guess with ribbons, ribbons. Yeah. yeah, that were secured with red ribbons. So it was knitwear, and it was pretty substantial. But it also, you know, you could you could air out your shoulders a little bit. I do often a, get hot shoulders. I, you don't want to have a sweaty shoulder. That's <sighs> you the just truth. Don't. That's all for the episode, guys. So thank you so much for listening. Charlie, Lisa, thanks for being here. Pleasure. Pleasure. If you'd like to see more of Charlie, Lisa, and my view of London Fashion Week, follow us on Instagram. I'm at Emily Crow. Charlie is at... Charlie Gowans. And Lisa? I'm at Miss Lisa Armstrong. See you in the DMs. (laughs) (laughs) Miss Lisa Armstrong. There are hundreds of Lisa Armstrongs. But only Uh, one that counts. (laughs) I'm one of a kind. (laughs) (laughs) I'm the only Charlie Gowns Eglinton in the world. (laughs) Shock no one to you. You can read all of our London Fashion Week coverage in the Wednesday paper and online at telegraph.co.uk slash fashion. What did you think of the shows? Email, tell us. We'd love to know what you made of them and the podcast. So write to us on unzipped at telegraph.co.uk. And if you'd like to read more, why not try a 30-day free trial of all of our premium content? You can unlock that at telegraph.co.uk forward slash fashion unzipped sub. Thanks so much for listening and join us next week for the Milan Fashion Week special. Do you have a friend who never pays their share of the bill? Or are your parents wasting your inheritance on flash cars and Caribbean cruises? Or maybe you have two children, but you can only afford to send one to a fee-paying school. The common thread? Money. And the moral problems that it so often leaves in its wake. I'm Lauren Davidson. And I'm Sam Meadows. We both report on personal finance for The Telegraph. And each week on our podcast, Moral Money, we're joined by one of our paper's best-loved columnists to unpick the thorny financial issues sent in by listeners. From stretching your work expenses to the ethics of paying less tax... This is the ultimate guide to what's okay and what's not in the blurred world of money morals. It's heated. It's lively. And it might even help you become a better person. Search for Moral Money in your favourite podcast app and click subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode.